You know, it's not easy for me to talk about my worst performing stocks on the channel. In fact, it's pretty embarrassing for me to have to show you them. But part of being a long-term investor is realizing when you've made a mistake, when you've made a bad call, admitting to it, and be willing to sell out of a stock, even if it is for a loss, if you know deep down that that is the right thing to do at the time. But today is not that day, because not only am I not selling out of my three worst performing stocks, I'm actually going to double down on every single one of them and invest long term. And in today's video, I'm going to explain exactly why I'm doing that. Now, thankfully, I am in the position where every single one of these stocks is only around 1% or less of my portfolio. So I can actually go in and buy a lot heavier and still not take on too much risk. But regardless, it's still a significant move on my part. So I thought it would be fun to talk about it in today's video. Let's go ahead and jump straight into this list. Okay, now the first of these three stocks is going to be none other than Teladoc Health, ticker symbol TDoc, who I'm currently down by about 10% on my position. So doubling down here will get me back to around the mid single digit percentage in terms of being down on that stock. But when looking at the broader stock in general, it's actually down massively more by almost 90% from its highs, which I think is absolutely insane and way overdone. I mean, this is a stock that was once traded for over $300 a share, but has now fallen to just around 30. That's pretty crazy. Now, to be fair, there is good reason for some of that crashing, but I just don't agree with all of it. Because even though the stock skyrocketed to over 300 during the pandemic, thanks to the rise of virtual healthcare, you have to remember that it was still trading more than three times higher before the pandemic than where it is today. So I get that it needed to come down from all the hype, but how are you gonna argue that this is an even worse company than before the pepperoni when we know that they experienced unbelievable growth from it and became a much larger company as a result? See, Teladoc specializes in telemedicine. In fact, they're a global leader of the market with large dominance even here in the United States at over 13% market share, while their next biggest rivals like Doctors on Demand and American Well are only at around 3% or less. The problem though is that a giant chunk of that market is made up of tiny little players that try to specialize in specific segments of the market or in certain locations and geographies and that's really scared investors because there's too much new competition being flooded into the market that saw an opportunity from the pandemic. But I actually see this as a good thing because as the market expands, hospitals are going to race to adopt telehealth solutions. And my theory is that they're going to go with the most trusted names in the space in order to save time and be more efficient. Investors are also worried though that the rise of telemedicine was just a fad since the use of it multiplied by nearly 80 times during the start of the pandemic at its peak, you know, fear with everyone staying home, but it later proceeded to crash once things started to open up again. However, the facts tell us that this change in the market is not going away. In fact, it's only going to get larger because a full year later, telehealth solutions were still being used a mind-blowing 38 times more than even the pre-pepperoni levels. Even recent surveys showed that only around 2% of patients that tried telehealth were extremely dissatisfied and only 4% were not satisfied, while 16% were neutral and 36% were somewhat satisfied and over 40% said that they were extremely satisfied due to the convenience and accessibility of it. And even physicians are on board with over 60% of them saying that telehealth is easy to use, over 50% saying that they feel happier at their job, and almost 70% saying that they want to increase the use of it in their practice. That's a huge deal because ultimately, it's the doctors that need to choose to implement these new technologies. And if they like it more than traditional methods, then I'm sorry, but that market is going to continue growing. And that's exactly what we're seeing. According to Fortune Business Insights, the market market is expected to continue skyrocketing from just around 40 billion before the pepperoni to well over a quarter of a trillion dollars, really closer to half a trillion by 2027, which is a growth rate of over 25%. I mean, it's a massive market massive market potential, I should say. And I just think that Teladoc will be able to easily match that market growth on their own over the long term. In fact, that's what they were already doing at an even higher rate before the pepperoni with growth of over 30% in 2019, then it skyrocketed to nearly 100% in 2020 and repeated that performance again in 2021. And yet everyone thinks that you can just double your sales in multiple years in a row with a ton of rising competition and not have to see some kind of correction after. 
That's ridiculous. If anything, I'd even be fine with Teladoc seeing negative growth this year, but they're actually putting up close to 20% positive growth, and that's likely to accelerate over time thanks to their growing user base that soared from around 30 million before the pepperoni to almost 57 million paid US members today, which are also paying higher fees over time too. And yet we're supposed to pretend that Teladoc is an even worse company now than before the, the pandemic. Well, that's fine with me because the lower that this growth stock goes, the more that I start to think that it might even be a value play too. I mean, I still wouldn't go as far to call it a value stock just because they are not currently profitable, we all know that, but just from a valuation standpoint, if you wanna look at it, I mean, they used to trade for a price to sales ratio of around 10 even before the pepperoni. Then they rose to nearly 40 during the pepperoni, but have now gone all the way down to just around two today. That is extremely cheap for a company that is, you know, that has this much future potential that did about two billion in sales in a market that is growing to like half a trillion. In fact, it's not only significantly less than their own five-year average, but it's even more than 50% cheaper than the broader sector too, when talking about the valuation. So for a market leader, I think that's far too cheap and I still love it. All right, moving on guys to stock number two. That's going to be a very similar one here with Palantir Technologies, ticker symbol PLTR, who just like Teladoc, has been getting absolutely destroyed over the past couple years, having now fallen by more than 80% from its highs. Now, Palantir IPO'd in 2020, where it immediately shot up and still remained elevated pretty high in the $20 range for some time before finally crashing you know, much harder into the single digits this past year. My personal position, by the way, is down about 12% right now, so I'm planning to double down here and bring it down to around 6%. Anyway, the reason why Palantir stock was performing so well initially was because of their amazing AI, artificial intelligence powered technology that is being used by the government for various military and defense contracts as well as public health and safety. For example, their Gotham AI operating system is used to help intelligence agencies and the military to collect, visualize, and analyze massive amounts of data for purposes of tracking, surveillance, and even decision-making on and off the battlefield. So it's basically like data analytics, data management, all that type of stuff. As an example, less than a year ago, Palantir was awarded a nearly $1 billion contract with the US Army to provide them with data analytics software for the preparation of future military threats. And more recently, they've helped on special projects like aiding in the Ukraine versus Russia conflict while also assisting in the evacuation efforts of Afghanistan. They've even helped identify massive money laundering operations as well. And there are countless more examples that I could run through, but even on the public safety side of things, I mean, even the CDC was was like paying them millions of dollars in exchange for Palantir helping them with disease monitoring during the pandemic. But one of the most exciting parts of their business is actually their smaller but much higher growth foundry commercial segment that helps businesses run more effectively and efficiently. For example, they've helped giant corporations like 3M with supply chain management and BP with lowering their emissions. And because Palantir is so well liked and trusted by the US government, we're now seeing a growing number of corporations start to trust them with their precious data too. In fact, this past quarter, their commercial customer count more than doubled year over year, which sent their commercial sales soaring by over 40%, which is a much higher rate than the 13% growth that you saw in government. Even their newer products like Palantir Healthcare are also taking off as it's now more than doubled in sales through the first half of this year. Still, investors are crashing the stock nonetheless because the largest part of Palantir's business still comes from government contracts at around 54% of their revenue versus commercial at 46%. And that government segment is just not growing fast enough for investors. But in my opinion, I think they're being way too short-sighted because Government contracts will always be volatile depending on the need of the country, and that's especially going to be the case right now during a recession that was caused by you know, overbloated budgets that skyrocketed our inflation. So they're just not awarding Palantir with as many contracts as they used to, as growth in that segment has dropped for them from over 60% last year to just the low teens this year. However, government spending and also military spending will always be on the rise long term. So it's only a matter of time before they start ballooning their defense budgets and all the other health budgets, everything else, and start awarding new contracts 
for Palantir. And in the meantime, their commercial segment has been picking up the slack. In fact, it's absolutely mind-blowing to me that during a literal economic recession, Palantir was still able to somehow grow their customer account by more than double the previous year. And those corporations are even giving more business to Palantir during this time with the top 20 customers increasing their payments by 17% as well. Yes, their overall revenue growth has slowed down to around 25% from the 40% plus that they saw during the pandemic, but this is still really high growth for being in a literal recession. And I still believe that we're going to one day see Palantir put up growth that could even be in the triple digits when some giant contracts get announced out of nowhere. Plus, their commercial segment is on track to become even larger than their government segment, which is what everyone was freaking out about, the low growth of government. Well, the commercial one has now grown to a, a growth clip of around 50%, which is up from 28% the year prior. So it's just a matter of time before it becomes a larger segment. And while the issue of profitability continues to linger, the majority of those losses are stock-based compensations that I believe will disappear over time. And once that happens, the pressure on their high adjusted gross margins of 80% or more will start to go away. And then I think that we'll start to see software-like profitability over the very long term, which we're already seeing at least some form of profitability with tens of millions in free and operating cash flows. Honestly, the valuation is still a bit expensive with this one if you only look at the sales, even though technically that's, I mean, I mean, it's dropped considerably from a PS in the 40s to now just the teens, but it's still a bit high here. But over the long term, I actually care more about the huge profit potential that they have and that they'll start to rake in. And that's when I think that my shares will start to soar right along with it. So that's why I'm sticking along for the ride. All right, guys, that's going to leave us now with the third, the last uh, bad performer here of the bunch that I plan to double down on, and that's going to be Meta, ticker symbol M-E-T-A, who I am currently down over 12% on and plan to double down back to around 6%. By the way, I am actually down more on Robinhood, but that's a much smaller stock and I'm actually not planning on doubling down on that one at this time, so that's why I'm going with Meta here instead. Anyway, just like the other stocks that I've mentioned so far, Meta stock has been getting absolutely crushed recently, having now fallen by close to 60% from its highs. But I also feel that it is yet another clear case of overselling and irrational, fe irrational fear from investors. People are treating Meta as if all hope is lost just because their growth is slowing down and they're investing so heavily into the metaverse. And don't get me wrong, I definitely understand a lot of that pessimism, especially with the metaverse stuff. I'll talk about that in a second. But, you know, you've got things to worry about here, like Facebook users declining for the first time in history recently, and their investments into the metaverse costed them over $10 billion last year and another nearly $3 billion this latest quarter alone. However, those Facebook users have recovered back up to a new record high, while overall users continue to grow every quarter, having now reached over 3.6 billion people thanks to other apps like Instagram. That's around half of the entire world's population, by the way, that is using some type of product from Meta. And while the investments into the metaverse are costly, there are estimates that the market could grow to literally trillions of dollars in the future because of things like virtual play, remote learning, virtual business, meetings, you know, virtual social media. There's so much potential in terms of what can be done in the metaverse. And Meta, with by far the most social media market share at around 80% just in the US alone, they, they easily have the largest user base that they can market all of those different things to over time. But look, I get it. The metaverse is not something that is investable in right now. It is just a very long-term future play for Meta. It's something where I feel as an investor, maybe 10 years out from now, I'll look back on it and be thankful that they invested so heavily in it because maybe they became one of the leaders in a giant market. But that's a market that isn't going to isn't going to uh, you know show its maturity or isn't going to show any kind of meaningful value until a very long time from now, many years out into the future. So you can't focus on the metaverse right now. That's just a future long-term play so that people don't forget about meta and the company doesn't just disastrously fall apart. What you need to focus on right now, if you're invested in meta, is that this is still a gigantic, massively profitable company that did over $100 billion in sales and almost $40 billion in net income profits just last year alone, and even higher operating cash flow that grew to nearly $60 billion. Yes, revenue growth is slowing down now. In fact, this year is expected to be flat, but 
We're literally in a recession, guys. I mean, do you think that the largest social media company that generates the largest amount of their money from advertising sales is not going to feel some heavy short-term pain during a recession? I mean, just the fact that they're even going to be flat after putting up such giant growth of almost 40% last year and another 20% plus the two prior years is pretty crazy to me. And they're still expected to recover to double-digit growth next year too. But by all accounts, this is not a company that is down for the count. Their users are still growing to record highs. And I would say that the problem is that the average revenue per user has crashed by literally billions of dollars just in the United States alone because of the clear recession that we're in, where advertisers are just not willing to spend as much as they used to. But you give it some time and those things should recover. Yes, they're investing super heavy into the metaverse. Yes, that's going to be weighing down on them. But they've got so many, pro they got so much profits. They have so such a monstrous balance sheet they can invest in whatever the heck they want guys and they're not just investing in the metaverse they're even investing in other avenues too like instagram reels by the way to compete better with tiktok which happened to surpass a billion dollar run rate run rate last quarter and has grown to 30 percent usage on instagram up from 20 percent the prior quarter so it's growing at a super high rate in fact even a recent survey from marketinghub.com showed that over 80% of the Gen Z population considers Reels to be the same thing as TikTok, and over 60% say that they even plan to use it more than TikTok in the future, and we all know how massive TikTok is. And Meta has even started to pay creators to post on Reels too, which should bring even more content to the platform. Look, I'm not saying Meta is a sure bet. They've got a scary and shaky future trying to go all in on the metaverse, but that is a very long, long-term play. And in the meantime, you're talking about a valuation here that is now around 50% cheaper than their own five-year average and anywhere between 2 to 20% cheaper than the broader sector despite being massively profitable and a market leader. I mean, I just think that the stock is oversold when you look at the value here in the stock, and that's why I'm willing to bet on it long term for what they're doing now and for what they plan to do in the very, very long term future. But hey, those are just my thoughts. Who cares what I think, guys? I'd love to hear your thoughts and your opinions down below. Do you own any of these stocks? Are you willing to buy more now that they've crashed even harder than before? Or are these stocks that you feel are risky and should be stayed away from? I still consider these to be fairly speculative, so they are high risk, but I think there is some reward potential long term, but that's just my thoughts. Anyway, I'd love to hear what you guys have to say down below. Thank you for watching. Thank you for all the support. I hope you're all doing well out there, and I will catch you in the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.